Welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs, India's oldest foreign policy think tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded... Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India, and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world, encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India, an Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change, and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons, and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook, which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now, this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I, for many years, have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public-funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks, and of course, with similar institutions elsewhere in the world. What I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy, that it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies. There is climate change. There is artificial intelligence. And there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs, India's oldest foreign policy think tank.
Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001 when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India, an Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945, ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future.
Welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs, India's oldest foreign policy think tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world, encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India an Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On the behalf of the Indian Council of World Affairs, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 38th Sapro House Lecture to be delivered by His Excellency Mr. Abdullah Shahed, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Maldives and, the, and President-elect of the 76th United Nations General Assembly. The Sapro House Lecture is the flagship lef public lecture series dedicated to the founders of the Indian Council of World Affairs and various rounds of lectures have been delivered by eminent persons and foreign dignitaries from fi fields of foreign policy and international politics. Today, uh, His Excellency Mr. Shahid will be addressing us on the theme of Presidency of Hope, 76th UNGA, COVID pandemic, and the need for reformed multilateralism. This lecture will be chaired by Ambassador Manjeev Singh Puri, former Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative of India to the United Nations. May I now invite uh, Dr. T.C. Raghavan, Director General, ICWA, to kindly deliver his welcome remarks. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for the Indian Council of World Affairs to have with us Dr. Abdullah Shahid to deliver this Sapru House Lecture to us today. Uh, he will be speaking on, he will be speaking on, he, he is of course no stranger to Sapru House and from this very platform he had delivered the fourth Sapru House lecture on the theme of challenges of democracy 
in the Maldives. You were then, Your Excellency, the Speaker of the People's Majlis. We are delighted to have you with us again today as a senior public figure and statesman of South Asia and also in your capacity as President-designate of the 76th UN General Assembly. May I congratulate you on the overwhelming majority with which you were elected to this very important post. May I also say that your election is a significant milestone in placing challenges faced by small island developing countries at the forefront of the international agenda. You bring to your you bring to the presidency of the UNGA, Your Excellency, a vast experience as a diplomat, as a parliamentarian, and most of all, as an activist for climate change, human rights, good and good governance. This brings renewed hopes for multilateralism based on the principles of equity, sovereign, sovereignty, and transparency. Your vision statement as the president-elect quote, presidency of hope, delivering for people, for planet, and for prosperity, unquote, embodies the optimism of many developing nations in the year which lies ahead of us. The Maldives has been championing for many years the need for global cooperation to tackle, to, to tackle the present-day global challenges through multilateral institutions by strengthening multilateralism and the United Nations in particular. We are particularly delighted, therefore, that you could join us this morning despite your very busy schedule. I'm very happy that we also have with us one of India's most experienced multilateralists, Ambassador Manjeev Singh Puri, to chair today's lecture. And I would now request him to deliver his opening remarks and also conduct this session. Thank you very much. Mr. Director General, thank you very much for both inviting me and for your kind words about me. Your Excellency, let me begin by congratulating you most heartily. Your Excellency, not only is your win in the General Assembly decisive in terms of numbers, but let me tell you, as someone from South Asia, how delighted and how pleased I am to see a South Asian once again chair the UN General Assembly. Your Excellency, during my time in the United Nations representing India for nearly five years, from 2009 to the end of 2013, we had the opportunity of holding the Vice Presidency on one occasion. And during the Vice Presidency, our Minister presided over the adoption of the resolution which resulted in the creation of UN Women. And I personally had the opportunity of presiding over the high-level segment where President Ahmadi Nijad, the Prime Minister of Australia, etc. spoke. So let me tell you, sir, we were only doing it for a few seconds and we are still puffed and chuffed by what we have achieved. You, sir, will be the President and am I so honoured and delighted to be sitting next to you. Sir, let me also add my welcome to that of the Director General to welcome you to this august place, Sapru House which in a sense embodies India's foreign relations and our aspirations on the international stage, having been the place where the very famous Asian Relations Conference was held in the mid-1940s. And you've been here earlier, so we are absolutely delighted. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you want to hear His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of the Maldives and the President-elect of the UN General Assembly. Let me just briefly introduce him to you, although he is a very well-known figure on the global stage. But, Your Excellency, if you will allow me, he started off in 1983 as a member of the Maldivian Foreign Ministry. Your Excellency, the Director General and I were also young officers of the Indian Foreign Ministry at the same time. But your wonderful career graph, that in about 10 years you made the crossover, and took the lead at political leadership. I don't know if we are still in a position to learn anything from that, but maybe time has moved on. His Excellency joined 
the area of leadership, politics if you may call it, right from 1994 and in the year 2007 became foreign minister of the Maldives for the first time. This is his second stint as foreign minister. Your Excellency, once again something which is very unique, but then you bring to the table extraordinary amount of experience, knowledge, not only of your country, not only of the region, but of the world, and we are all going to be beneficiaries of that. In between, sir, you also served as the Honorable Speaker of the Majlis. So we are extremely delighted. I was personally very happy to see the sort of theme that you have chosen for your uh, presidency, the presidency of hope. And you talk in terms of the COVID, you talk in terms of the pandemic, in terms of the challenges. But I think it is particularly good that we have someone like you who would sit at the chair of the General Assembly and preside over it at a time when hopefully we are turning the tide on terms of multilateralism, the belief in multilateralism, how important it is and how it is necessary for the resolution of issues which are truly global and which require global solutions. Without much ado, Your Excellency, I would like to invite you to speak to our audience, which I want to tell you is scattered all over India and overseas, a very large number of people. In fact, Your Excellency, from the last time that you were here in Sapru House to now, and particularly under the stewardship of the Director General, there has been a huge amount of what he calls the democratization of foreign policy in India. Today, there are thousands of people who tune in to the Sapro House lectures, who listen to what's going on. And in fact, after you've spoken, and if you will agree, we'll take questions from the chat boxes, which will come from all over India and overseas. So the reach and outreach of what is taking place today is truly global, and I am so glad that we have the opportunity of having you with us. Your Excellency, uh, they normally say the floor is yours, but nowadays I'm told the word is the screen is yours, <laughs> Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Ambassador Manjeev Singh Puri, for that very generous introduction. Uh, thank you also, Dr. Rangavan, uh, for the very warm welcome accorded to me and this opportunity to speak here at the Indian Council of World Affairs. Uh, let me tell you that I'm so delighted uh, to return to Sapro House, and uh, it's a, a unique honor for me. It is uh, indeed a special honor to be here in New Delhi once again. When I last visited Delhi in April of this year, India was at the cusp of one of the most aggressive surges of COVID-19 anywhere in the world but legendary resilience of the Indian people has once again shined through. The enduring spirit of Indian people will most definitely lead this great country to overcome any challenge it faces. I have full trust in that. We also have full trust in the generosity of the Indian people. Around the world, India Indian generosity has ensured that people in 95 countries have COVID-19 vaccines. Essential medicines were gifted by India to more than 150 countries. And I, with the world, applaud this leadership. Dear colleagues, last year the world was brought to its knees by a virus we could not see. Life as we knew it changed considerably. At the end of the year, we saw glimmers of hope. Vaccines were being developed, but no one had a clear picture of how quickly production could be scaled up, nor how effective the vaccine could be. Today, as the dust settles, we could perhaps say the picture is a bit clearer, but it is not something to celebrate. We now know that the world's economy shrank by 4.3% in 2020 wiping out trillions of dollars. We know that countries have fallen further into debt. For the first time in 20 years, global poverty is likely to increase significantly. 114 million people lost their jobs in 2020. While many have had their working hours or pay cuts 
or fallen into economic inactivity, meaning they had to withdraw from the labor force. We now know that women, people of color, indigenous people, young people, the poor, they have been affected the most. More than 1.7 billion students, that is about 90% of the world's student population, have been impacted by schools or university closures. Commercial flights dropped by 42%, disrupting connectivity and supply chains. If this time last year we were grappling with a pandemic, we could not understand, trying to understand the long-term impacts, we could not assess, struggling for information. This year we are figuring it out, or we need to figure it out, how we can overcome this pandemic, how we return to normalcy, a new normal, a different normal. Over the course of the campaign for the presidency of the General Assembly, I was asked many times the question, why hope? My answer is, why not? Today, we live in a world of despair. Disease prevails in every corner. Floods are washing away lives and livelihoods. Heat waves are burning up communities. Conflicts rage on. Acts of terrorism are rampant. This is a bleak world indeed, but there have been glimmers of light in the small acts of kindness that have made huge impacts. In the countless sacrifices, health workers and frontline workers have made across the world. In the unrelenting spirit of scientists who have found a vaccine in record time. Here, in these incidences of hope lives and hope grows. Hope, it is what drives us forward. Hope is what will make us stand up once again. Hope is what we need today to counter this bleak world of disease, despair and devastation. Hope is also inbuilt into the ethos of every Maldivian. We are a small country, a country of many challenges that has been dealt many blows and faces the wrath of climate change every day. We would have given up many, many years ago, if not for hope. It is what keeps us going. The promise of a better tomorrow, the hope of a better tomorrow. This is why I chose hope as the central theme of my presidency. While the 75th session was about confronting COVID-19, I want to make the 76th session about recovery. This is why the theme I have chosen for the general debate of the 76th session of the General Assembly focuses on looking forward, on building resilience with hope as our driving force. My immediate priority will be recovering from COVID-19. The impacts have been immense and yet still this pandemic seems to be far from over. New variants are emerging and we are still unclear about the long-term health consequences. The United Nations can and must do more to address this. Building on existing initiatives and approaches, I will be looking to address the health of our people and our economies and work to ensure vaccine equity. We need to vaccinate the entire world. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Together, we need to overcome the challenges that we face in vaccinating the world. This includes the private sector, the philanthropic organizations, the academia, scientists and the government. We need to look towards building back better. We need to look towards building back stronger and bluer. We started in 2020 fully intent on making ensuing the decade of action generating momentum on realizing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. But today, the decade of action has had to become the decade of recovery. This is why my second ray of hope, my second priority, is rebuilding sustainably. A post-COVID world would ideally be a world without extreme poverty, one that is more sustainable, more resilient, 
a world where we have taken meaningful action on addressing hunger and food security, where we have realized access to quality education and bridged the digital divide. It is a world where the means of implementation are realized, a world at peace. Targeted interventions will be needed to ensure that no one is left behind, to ensure that no country is left behind. The needs of our home, our planet, must be addressed as a matter of urgency. COVID-19 has not replaced the challenges of climate change, ocean health, desertification, and land degradation, and loss of biodiversity. In fact, it has limited the scope of, for addressing these challenges as limited resources have been diverted towards the pandemic. But the impacts of climate change are worsening. At a glance, at this month's headlines, heat waves, floods, tidal waves, these are all signs of climate emergency. The 76th session can be a super session for nature, with multiple conferences and meetings, such as COP26 on climate change, the Ocean Conference, COP15 on biodiversity, COP15 on desertification, the Energy Dialogue, conferences on, conferences on sustainable transport and food systems. There is momentum on responding to the needs of our planet. Addressing the needs of our planet is equally important, especially given that humanity, human rights, have taken back slide during the pandemic as more and more people lived through lockdowns and extreme measures had taken around the world. Ensuring that we respect the rights of all, mobilizing the collective will and conscience of humanity is a process requiring constant work. I have pledged to ensure more voices and more space for young people in the General Assembly. I truly believe that we need to fully ensure participation of young people in decision-making processes that affect the future. Gender equality is a top priority for me. I will raise my voice against gender discrimination, advocate for gender equality. My office will be gender balanced. Now these priorities that I have outlined above, demands of the day, can only be addressed with a stronger, effective, efficient, transparent, and accountable United Nations. A United Nations that is more representative of the Charter's first three words, we, the peoples. A United Nations family that works together, coordinates, cooperates, and enhances coherence. A United Nations that is more inclusive, that hears the views of all, that takes into account the needs of all. And my responsibility is to ensure that the General Assembly demands and designs a United Nations that is ready, that is able, and that is best suited to serve the needs of the day. This is why my fifth ray of hope is reforming the United Nations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the concept of reformed multilateralism put forward by Prime Minister Modi during his statement at the general debate of the 75th session of the General Assembly highlighted these facets as well. The need to ensure transparent and inclusive decision making, the need to understand and recognize the links between peace, security and development, and the need to adopt a multi-stakeholder approach. He highlighted this in the context of making the United Nations fit for purpose to address the challenges of the day. In considering the role of the United Nations in addressing global issues, we need to consider the strengths of the United Nations. I believe that the strength of the United Nations lies in its ability to shape norms, change discourse, forge consensus. The United Nations has the convening power to bring together the best minds, the best ideas, the best practices, and forge the best solutions. The United Nations has the ability to provide platforms for countries, peoples to share ideas and find solutions that work for all. The United Nations has the expertise at hand to assess situations on the ground and deliver targeted interventions where necessary, hand in hand with local authorities. 
I believe this is the strength of the United Nations. This is where the United Nations can make its mark. And this is important role truly be realized through established trust in the United Nations. Trust can be built by bringing the United Nations closer to the people, by increasing its efficiency, its effectiveness, by making the United Nations deliver, deliver for the people, for the planet, and for prosperity. The COVID-19 pandemic may have put the world in crisis, but I believe this could also be an opportunity to build a stronger, resilient world, a more suitable, a more sustainable world. This could be an opportunity to enhance multilateralism, strength, cooperation. This is an opportunity for the United Nations to once again, just like it did in the aftermath of the Great Wars, play a central role in rebuilding communities, rescuing the planet, recovering economies, and above all, restoring hope. As President of the General Assembly, I will do all I can. I will give all I can to make this reality a reality. Thank you. Your Excellency, thank you very much for these wonderful remarks, which, you know, not only kindle hope, but let me say that they also are a sign of determination for want to do something. And I don't think that the UN could have been better served than having someone like you, who is obviously a convinced multilateralist, but one who believes that multilateralism shows the way forward. So thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for your remarks, for your address. And I am sure all over the world this would have been listened to with a great deal of attention and interest. Your Excellency, if I may request you to take a few of the questions which our wide audience is throwing up. These questions are, are some on basic issues of multilateralism. And if you will allow me, I would also put in a few, some with a slightly India perspective, some with a global perspective. But then there are some which are also focused on what you bring to the table, your country brings to the table. So let me start with that one first. And this is a very interesting question about equitable distribution of global resources. And the question has been posed, Your Excellency, in the specific context of the small island developing states. And I thought that would really interest you because, you know, that's the core of what you've been championing and from which you take yourself to the wider multilateral world. And the question is, with the Maldives having the presidency of the UNGA at this important time and as an important member of the SIDS, what and how will you bring the focus back on equitable distribution of global resources and the specific needs of the SIDS? Do you really have a plan of action? Are there things that you really wish to do? Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, I think this is a very appropriate question. Uh, the fact that Maldives is going to be chairing uh, or preside in the General Assembly uh, is symbolic of the role of uh, small island development states at the United Nations. Uh, Maldives is going to be only the sixth country uh, to preside uh, of the group of small island countries, uh, which number about one third of the United Nations uh, membership. Uh, Every day, the small island states, the population of small island uh, states, we go to bed, we wake up uh, with the fear uh, that we are going to be submerged uh, under the waters uh, because of the sea level rise. Uh, we have been uh, championing the issue of uh, climate change uh, not because we want, because it is necessary for us. It is a matter of survival for us. Uh, we, it's a life experience for us. The only way we can survive uh, into the next century, uh, into the next uh, several centuries, is to make sure that mankind, humankind, 
realizes that the resources that we have in this uh, planet Earth, our Mother Earth, is not uh, infinite, is not belonging to certain countries only. It's a common uh, global uh, package that we have to have a share as well. We may be small, but we are part of the family. As this uh, virus has shown us, uh, and I, I think one of the lessons that this virus has shown us is that uh, the importance of multilateralism, that no one is safe until everyone is safe. It's so important that we translate that concept into the into our social field, the economic field, and our entire relationship as a, a human race. And uh, with this uh, in mind, I will do everything possible uh, using the powers of uh, my convening power as the president of the General Assembly uh, to bring countries uh, together uh, in order to uh, get this message that the resources are a common uh, commodity of uh, humankind. And it's not only us who are uh, living today, but it's also um, several uh, who are going to follow up. It's, uh, that's the message I want. Your Excellency, you've said it so beautifully. Uh, I think there should be little doubt in the minds of all of us that sustainability in terms of both production and consumption and an understanding that there is a global common and we need to collaborate for it, I think is seminal. And I do believe that your presidency and the fact that you will be sitting at the helm of affairs when the COP will take place in Glasgow, which is a very important element in terms of global climate negotiation, I think would even symbolically draw attention to the entire facet that we need to collaborate and we need to do things and move forward. But Your Excellency, I have long association with climate negotiations along with many of your own colleagues, including the current speaker of the Majlis. What are we seeing? We are seeing lots of good words. There is absolutely no doubt about that. We are seeing a lot of action by countries like India. Look at our figures in terms of what the challenges we've taken on in terms of renewable energy. We are seeing a lot of action in terms of what some countries in the European continent are doing. But on the other hand, we find that both in terms of integrity of the compact as well as in terms of trust, there appears to be a certain deficiency. The recent summit of the largest countries certainly came short in terms of what developing countries need for their adaptation needs and otherwise what they need in terms of technology and finance. I think you would be sitting there at a position where your ability to be able to influence this would be at the greatest. And I think all of us from the developing world, Your Excellency, will count on what you want. You've listed a number of these major institutional arrangements which will be meeting and as you said, a special super session for nature would be happening. But decarbonization is a very important element of what we are doing. Let me ask you, Your Excellency, how do you want to see you fashion yourself, not just the UN Secretariat, but your own office, your own personality? After all, you have a huge amount of influencing purely by being the President of the General Assembly. In being able to take the world when it comes together on climate change to be more collaborative, to be more trusting and to be willing to do the necessary things which need to be, which are required to be done for what is the greatest requirement of the greatest number in the world which are in the developing world including the small island developing states. So maybe sir, your ideas and your plans especially in the area of climate. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, climate is going to be one of the 
main focus areas uh, for me because, uh, as I said earlier, it's an issue of survival uh, for my uh, own country as well as a uh, large number of uh, countries, including almost all the small island developing countries. Uh, as I said in my introductory uh, statement, uh, 76, during the 76th session, we are going to see a large number of international conferences. Uh, and that is why I regard uh, the 76th session of the General Assembly as a super session of uh, for nature. Now, it's my intention uh, to make sure that uh, we push every possible button to make sure that the COP26, the Oceans Conference, and so many other conferences that are lined up come up with definitive action plans. It is also my intention to convene uh, a session, a high-level session, at the end of, uh, towards the end of my presidency, so that I would be able to tie up all these individual conferences and bring the international community together and, and take stock of what we have been able to achieve during the super session, kind of tying up uh, my presidency at the end of uh, my term uh, to take stock of how we have reacted to the opportunity that uh, we have been given as the super session uh, for nature. And uh, I'm sure that uh, that will make, uh, by doing so, we'll be able to have a program throughout my term follow up uh, so that the final uh, high level segment, high level session uh, would be the final stock take. Your Excellency, thank you, and I wish all power to your elbows, and I'll tell you what I really wish for, that the developing countries remain strong no matter our diversity, no matter that you have a country of India size on one side, you have the small island developing states, you have countries in Africa, because if we remain strong in our push and pressure, the negotiations will be such, or their outcome will be such, that we would also be those who would be part and parcel of the solution and gainers, in a, in a, if I may say so. Your Excellency, let me take you to a slightly different subject, something which is all, the, all over the screen and everyone is interested in, obviously you understand the Indian perspective in that. And that is the institutional arrangements at the United Nations. You yourself referred to the Honorable Prime Minister of India's reformed multilateralism, the call for that. And you, I think, underscored and understood that at the end of the day, multilateralism is about an institutional arrangement. And if this institutional arrangement's various threads work rightly, chances are that it will come up with outcomes which are beneficial to humankind. Now, when you would have announced your candidacy, things were perhaps at a kind of gloom. But if we look at the gloom, it wasn't only because the COVID pandemic was raging. It was because those who consider themselves to be at the core of multilateralism felt that their hegemony was not really the only hegemony that was around. Whatever reasons, there are challenges. Developing countries are coming to the fore. The voices are becoming bigger. At the core of all this, in New York, sits the Security Council. And I don't think we can look away from that. You also mentioned this particular thing. I think uh, most of us sitting in India, of course, feel very strongly that it needs to be more representative. I would like to ask you on a few specific aspects which are listed here. Many of the people are asking questions, what would you do in terms of reform of the Security Council? Very general questions. But Your Excellency, this process has gone on now for, what, 13, 14, 15 years. Generally speaking, most processes at the UN tend to have a certain kind of focus after one or two meetings in terms of a chair, in terms of some text, etc. There is a meander that we tend to see. Now, I understand the global power play, but at the end of the day, the presidency of the General Assembly and the president himself has the great suasion ability to be able to try and take things forward. You have mentioned reform. You mentioned reformed multilateralism. 
my interest in this of course is india but my interest is also greater representation for all those who didn't get representation in 1945 so that their voices are truly heard in multilateralism and that's how decisions get taken your excellency how do you look at it i'm sure over a long period that you've had been associated with foreign affairs you have certain ideas i would like to hear from you what are your views what is it that you are looking for and what is it perhaps aspirationally in your final session we can look for some kind of outcome in this direction too uh, thank you ambassador uh, talking about security council reform uh, brings uh, uh, to me uh, the role that the Maldives have uh, been playing uh, in this uh, very important effort at the United Nations. Uh, way back in the 1970s, you would recall uh, that the uh, 10 countries submitted a letter to the UN uh, requesting for the inclusion of an agenda item uh, on the reform of the Security Council. Maldives was one of those countries. We were among the 10 countries who initiated this process at the United Nations. And to say that it is taking a long time is an understatement because perhaps when this letter was signed by Maldives and submitted, I was only 10 years old. Never thought that I would get an opportunity <laughs> to be presiding uh, over the United Nations General Assembly and be actually tasked with getting something done on this process. It also is a fact uh, that the current political realities are not reflected in the membership of the United Nations Security Council. The 10 countries who initiated it realized it in the 70s. So many countries, and I would say the entire membership of the United Nations now agree that there needs to be institutional reform of the Security Council, including uh, the representation of uh, new permanent members. At a bilateral level, level Maldives' position on this uh, has been made clear uh, many, many times by our leadership, uh, including uh, former governments, that the Maldives uh, supports uh, the bid of uh, India uh, to have a permanent seat. The process of the reform of the Security Council is a membership-driven process. The intergovernmental negotiating uh, process, as you rightly said, has been ongoing. I intend to appoint efficient, effective uh, co-facilitators uh, to continue the work that has been carried out during the 75th session and, uh, Ambassador, I just wish that I had this magic wand that I could <laughs> cast and get this process done before my son or one of uh, my son's age uh, gets to preside and still have the process on the table. But, uh, Ambassador, you having been at the United Nations, you would very well know uh, that uh, this is a uh, purely uh, membership-driven process. Uh, I, on my part as uh, the president, I will do everything possible uh, to get this uh, process moving a bit more fast and a bit more quickly. Thank you, Excellency. I sincerely hope that it shall not be in the generations to come because I also feel that as you expressed very well yourself, there is an understanding in the world that something needs to be done. Sometimes in even knowing what you want to do, but not knowing how to do it or more than that, what the outcome should be, you tend to stall things. But I am sure that in the hands of someone like you with your ability to be able to, let me say, guide and influence the thinking of those who will be chairing these processes, I'm sure there would be a forward movement, and I think that's the important thing. 
Your Excellency, let me turn to a subject which is of some interest here in India, or rather quite a lot of interest in India, but something that you in the Maldives are also quite familiar with. And I don't see that in the screen here. Perhaps these are lots of young people. Uh, and this is the subject of terrorism. We in South Asia are particularly, especially in India, you are aware, sir, that we have been victims of terrorism for long. Today, this scourge is all over the world. We've seen it in different forms. There are people here who are asking questions about what Afghanistan would do, etc. I'll come to that later. But on the subject of terrorism, you know that for a very long time, India has had this draft out there on the Comprehensive Convention Against International Terrorism. Again, something on which the movement is really not there. I think we must candidly accept this fact. Again, I would like to ask you if this is a subject matter on which, Your Excellency, you've given some thoughts. You did mention in your vision paper that terrorism is of importance to you. I hope that during your time, it would be possible for you to again give a certain kind of guidance and see if we can try and conclude this. Because I'm sure in the world, there would be hardly anyone barring one or two outliers who in any case need to be you know, identified, who would not want to see a good, huge, strong global compact against terrorism. I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Ambassador. Terrorism is a scourge. It's, uh, it doesn't know religion. It has no religion. It has no borders. It has no soul. It is pure evil. The amount of innocent people that uh, has fallen victims of terrorism, uh, the amount of families that it has hurt, uh, the amount of people that it has maimed uh, is unbelievable. And for what? Just because some people believe that they are better than others, some people believe that uh, their belief is better than others, uh, some people believe that uh, they should only have the resources. And for these unethical, inhuman beliefs is what keeps terrorism being promoted. What we require now, uh, as uh, Ambassador you said very correctly, is for the political leadership of the world to come together. And the best message that we could send to terrorists now is to come up with the Comprehensive Convention on uh, Terrorism. Once we are able to at least agree on the definition, then uh, the terrorists would know that, yes, the United Nations have spoken, that the world community has spoken, that terrorists nowhere in the world have space. Now, the Convention on uh, Terrorism uh, once again, Ambassador, uh, let me also uh, recall uh, my first uh, General Assembly session was 1988. Uh, and I, uh, as a young Foreign Service officer, was also assigned to sit in the Fifth Committee. And that is where this convention has been. From 1988, I sat through 88, 89, until 94. Every year, I was in the Sixth Committee. Uh, and we tried to do some work, but never got through it. And now here, I'm not in the sixth committee, but as a presiding officer, <laughs> as the president of the General Assembly, and still uh, the document is there. So I would urge the membership of the United Nations to do their utmost uh, to come together, uh, because this is a responsibility, a collective responsibility that has been tasked uh, to us all, no one is going to benefit. Everyone is going to lose. Everyone has been losing. You don't know when and where the terrorists would strike again. So I will do everything possible uh, to have some movement uh, within the Sixth Committee. Uh, 
it is going to be of immense personal satisfaction and pride for me if the sixth committee could come up uh, with the definition during my presidency, uh, a committee which I have set uh, many, many times. Thank you, Ambassador. <laughs> Your Excellency, I, I, I'm sure it's some kind of a, an ambition coming true that, you know, the statement that you read out then in the sixth committee finally reaches fruition. Your Excellency, taking off from the same ideas of terrorism, extremism, etc., in our part of the world today, there is a growing and huge worry on what is happening in Afghanistan. I want to ask you, and many people here are also asking this, do you see a role for the United Nations in the unfolding of things in Afghanistan, the stabilization of the country, its future, and so on, the Western Alliance having taken its decisions? Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador, uh, the maintenance of international peace and security uh, is mandated to the Security Council of the United Nations, and therefore the United Nations has a very clear role in what is happening in Afghanistan. I have uh, every trust in the people of Afghanistan. The Afghani people are resilient people. Their leadership is strong. Their government uh, is a democratic government elected by the people, and uh, I wish them all the best. Uh, I think uh, we all, uh, international community, needs to come together and assist the Afghani people in whatever way they so desire so that they could uh, have uh, the way forward uh, that is being charted out uh, by their government and people. Uh, your Excellency, thank you very much for this. This is good to hear that you know your engagement, at least on a personal level, will be there. And you know the President himself being involved tends to involve the institution, and that's, I, in my opinion, very important. Your Excellency, let me take you to where you began your, your, your vision for hope, which is the COVID pandemic. Now, of course, the WHO has been involved as a technical body, giving support, giving advice. Sometimes people asking the question that, you know, they're not giving timely advice or whatever else has been happening. But the UN in general, and I don't mean just the General Assembly, but the UN and most of its bodies have been kind of away from it, a few statements by the Secretary General. Today there is a great deal of interest or rather there is a pressing demand for universal access to vaccination. There is also a great deal of interest that the UN must do more. Now you have put it at the top of your vision and rightly so because this is the first element of the hope and recovery that we need to do. What are your feelings, Your Excellency, on universal access to vaccination? including a demand put forward by India and South Africa for sharing of IPRs and, you know, for making these things available and for seeing that we are better and far more equipped and together in meeting any such challenges now and in the future. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I intend to bring uh, all the countries together at the United Nations, uh, perhaps uh, during the high-level segment. Uh, I intend to bring the vaccine producers, the distributors, uh, and the countries together. I think uh, this is not a time to finger pointing. I think this is a time uh, to share, uh, take stock, and uh, chart a future course of action. We need to get everyone vaccinated uh, in the world by the end of uh, 2022, latest. If we are serious about uh, this, uh, this, this pandemic, uh, confronting this pandemic, and that is why I have made uh, this as my first priority. Uh, I believe uh, it is doable. I believe it is doable, and I believe that there is enough goodness in humanity uh, to come together, uh, given the experiences that we have gone through in the past uh, year. I think this is the right time. I think uh, there is a lot of goodwill. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, the convening power that I have as President of the General Assembly to bring all the parties together and uh, address this as one of my top priorities. Your Excellency, I see that we are running out of time, but taking on from what you just said, 
use your tremendous power, the convening power to take things forward. Let me ask you one question which I think interests the future generation. How do you plan to invigorate and interest the youth and take advantage of their energies for taking things forward on the multilateral plan? Youth uh, is an area where I, need, I intend to concentrate uh, heavily. And uh, to that effect, uh, I always recall uh, my first entrance into the General Assembly. Uh, as I used to say, uh, I was much younger. I had much more hair and uh, I was much more adventurous uh, when I first entered uh, the General Assembly Hall. Uh, it is that experience I had as a young person uh, that has uh, given me the confidence in multilateralism. I believe that for multilateralism to gain credence, we need to give opportunity for young people uh, to be part of this process. We have a tendency to always talk about how important young people are, how that they will be the future leaders. And uh, this has been going on. I recall when I was uh, younger, uh, my seniors uh, in their lectures in school and others, they will always say this. You are going to be the future of the nation, the future of the world, all these things. But this is a natural process. What is incumbent on us is to prepare the future leadership, give opportunity to them, give them a voice so that they could be part of what they are going to inherit in the future. And to that effect, uh, I am coming up with a specific program to provide young diplomats, especially from the underrepresented countries, to give them an opportunity to be part of this journey that I'm embarking on the 15th of September, the presidency of hope. I intend to create a general uh, PGA fellowship program, a PGA youth fellowship program, whereby young diplomats from underrepresented countries would be given an opportunity through the office of the President of the General Assembly to come and work within my office or within their respective missions. So that during the one year of Presidency of Hope, I will be able to give an opportunity to plant that seed of multilateralism in maybe 10 or 15 young diplomats across the world. And God knows, it may come out very well. And also it is my hope that uh, the 77th president also will continue this uh, youth fellowship program of the president, which will be educating and giving opportunity for many, many youth uh, around the world. Your Excellency, this would have gladdened the hearts of the large number who are watching this. And I hope that there would be lots of applicants for what you are doing. Your Excellency, let me congratulate you once again for your election as the President of the General Assembly. A great honor and for us a great privilege to have a friend and someone for our region leading the world. We want to wish you all power to your elbows all powers to your country and we wish all of us all the very best under your stewardship. Your Excellency, thank you very much. I would now hand over back to the Director General of ICW. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. And uh, uh, may I first of all formally thank you for this most profound uh, delivery of the 38th Sapru House uh, lecture. Uh, I. Uh, it was a wide-ranging uh, address, and I would not try to summarize it in any way. 
But I was left with two principal structural uh, takeaways which struck me and uh, which I think will remain with me. Because on the one hand, you spoke about the, the damage which the pandemic has uh, wrought on our lives, on our societies, on our economies, uh, the necessity of hope. Uh, and finally, that, that from this very searing ordeal which we've all been through, we have to carry forward the message of sustainability. So I think that was one principal uh, axis. And the second thing which you tried to integrate, which you integrated into this first axis, uh, was a second axis which was about uh, the strength of the United Nations. And it's something which I think we need to be reminded about, and which we need to remind ourselves uh, uh, about the great spirit of inclusiveness which has driven it. And most of all, its convening power, or what we can call uh, its narrative uh, value. And I think you were uh, absolutely spot on by identifying that uh, as being the principal instrument which you have. Uh, because you are, in a sense, going to be at the intersection, uh, or you are going to be the concentration of this great convening power of the United uh, Nations. So thank you very much, Your Excellency, for this most uh, profound address uh, and its message of uh, optimism, uh, but also an optimism informed by your own great experience as a diplomat and as a public uh, servant. Uh, I'm also very, very happy that for Sapru House, we had this opportunity to have this conversation between two convinced multilateralists. Uh, and it is somewhat rare uh, in this day and age to encounter two such well-informed individuals who are truly convinced about the values of multilateralism as we chart our difficult way forward, uh, both nationally and, of course, on the global uh, arena. So for us in Sapru House, it was a great privilege that both you and Ambassador Manjeev Singh Puri could spend so much time with us. Uh, I do hope, Your Excellency, that you will be back in Sapru House uh, uh, in the future. And we would very much like to hear from you again uh, about your own experience of multilateralism after you have occupied the seat, which, as I said, represents the concentration of the narrative power of the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to you joining us for our upcoming events.